My name is Michael Guyad, publisher of The Lead Lag Report. Joining me for the hour is Mr. Michael Belkin, the man, the myth, the legend, who also has some technical difficulties. Uh, Michael, for those who are not familiar with your background, real quick, just introduce yourself. Who are you? How did you get involved in markets? And what are you doing with The Belkin Report? Okay, great. Sorry, everybody, for uh, the problems. So I came out of UC Berkeley Business School and Staff Department. My uh, driving passion is applying models to forecasting, systematic trading, I developed a forecasting model based on my studies in time series analysis. So what I do is time series analysis. I studied Box Jenkins and Arima, uh, Box Jenkins and Arima models and Fourier analysis. I worked at Solomon Brothers for about five years. I ended up in proprietary trading. I was the quantitative strategist in crop trading in the equity uh, department. Uh, I started out in market analysis with Laszlo Guarini. So um, what I do is... My model gives uh, three things, direction, position, intensity. It's a forecast, okay? Not looking at what's already happened, you know, in the rearview mirror or where we're at today, like what's supposed to happen next. And I use mostly, um, it's a 12-period forecast using weekly and monthly data. It gives direction, position, and intensity. Direction, up, down, or neutral. Position, beginning, middle, or end. And intensity or confidence interval. So I'm always looking for the strongest signals. That's number three intensity and no matter where they happen to be and they that changes over time so uh to put things in perspective i was super bearish on the stock market last year from the beginning of the year until october 17th i was short all the way down my model turned positive on that's just on the indexes in terms of sector rotation which the model is best at really um you know what to buy what to sell what to short what to you know what not to short so uh, my, everything changed for me on October 17th, which was the first report after the NASDAQ bottom on October 14th. I've been long the NASDAQ and U.S. stocks ever since. Also European stocks. That position was closed out this week on Monday, European stocks. So I've been bullish for a long time based on my model, you know, and uh, it was kind of, it, it wasn't an easy trade. There was a lot of, a lot of uh, negativity out there. I'm also a strategist, okay, an investment strategist, and how do the pieces of the puzzle fit together? What's going on with sentiment? What's going on with the Federal Reserve, et cetera? And let me just give you in a nutshell where I, like this week's report, so I published the Belkin Report. It's a weekly report for institutional investors, covers sectors, individual stocks, stock indexes, bonds, everything, you know, macro stuff, micro stuff. So here are the bullet points from this week's report. We can start with that and I work back, backwards, okay? So Federal Reserve monetary policy is always behind the curve. In 2021, Fed Chairman Powell proclaimed, we are not even thinking about thinking about raising interest rates. Proclamations like that encouraged banks like Silicon Valley Bank Corp to load up on US treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. Seven Fed rate hikes later, <laughs> after he said we're never gonna raise rates, from 0.25% to 4.5% on the Fed funds rate, banks who followed Powell's guidance are underwater on their long bond and note holdings and are going belly up. This wasn't a crisis of regulation, maybe that contributed to it, but it was uh, missed guidance. So the Fed is all being really big on guidance. It was completely wrong. It completely misled everybody in the financial community to load up on long-term debt securities. The Fed's now made the opposite mistake pledging to keep interest rates up and rising long after inflation has peaked. In my work, uh, the inflation peaked in uh, the PPI, retail sales, most of the economic indicators peaked about a year ago, almost April, May, June. PPI, CPI, the, the rate is falling. It's not down to their level yet, but it's the, the annual rate of change is not down to their 2% target. But those who followed the Fed's latest tightening guidance, that would be macro hedge funds, like MAN Group in uh, in the UK, are suffering. They're now at risk of going underwater on their short T-bonded T-note positions. So that's the opposite position of what the banks, so the banks are hurting and, you know, they're down 20, 30% on the long bond positions that the Fed convinced them to, to get into. Now, the Fed has done the opposite thing to macro hedge funds, telling them to be short T-bonds and T-note positions. Let me flesh that out for you real quickly. In the Commitments of Traders, COT Commitments of Traders report, there are 422,000, these are spec shorts, large spec shorts. So in, in the 
you know, the futures market, there's always a long for a short, but the short, the spec shorts are super loaded up to the gills. Short 30 year minus 422,000, total of uh, almost 600,000 between the ultra and the 30 year. And then the 10 year is another 627,000 contracts. That amounts to 1.23 million in the 10 and 30 year contracts. That is a huge number. You can look this up on bar chart just to look for perspective of where that is. It's like a record, you know, or it's as bad as it was before COVID hit when the, when the bonds got squeezed. It doesn't stop there. The five year, they're short minus 652,000 two year, minus 656,000. That's another 1.3 million. So all in all, that's 2.5 million contracts of large spec shorts in uh, government bond and Tino futures. So, and the and now we've got a potential peak in the Fed rate cycle, right? So I see, see this as a return to QE, this bank bailout thing, which it, it's basically open-ended QE for the Fed. So I think it's bullish in a roundabout way, not completely on everything, but it's a return to QE. It's a complete reversal of Fed policy. Okay, so the and, 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 and hold on, because I, I want because I want there's a lot I want to unpack on that before you continue. So, and I, I go back to our prior conversation. I think back in December, I was arguing then. I thought there was a, a window for a stock market crash. You said no. I think we were both right in some way. Market didn't crash, but was the fifth worst December in history. But I have been with you on this. I've seen the same data on the uh, speculative short side for Treasuries. Which is what is reasserting, I would argue, the flight to safety trade, which is what broke so badly last year. In other words, as you're seeing heightened volatility, now people are realizing that long duration treasuries are the pristine, safe collateral. Now, it, some people hearing that would think that, well, that means stocks have to go down if treasuries are going down and yield themselves. I put out a tweet earlier that shows that historically, after major drawdowns for stocks, there's drift in treasuries, meaning you tend to see yields drop. You tend to see further performance as stocks are coming out of a big decline. Uh, it sounds to me like you think that irrespective of sentiment for stocks, that positioning on treasuries is bullish treasuries, makes it more of a layup than equities maybe in the near term, but that there might still be even further performance there if we're back into your point. Uh, kind of a, a roundabout return of QE. Yeah, uh, it's bullish for bonds. I think it's just the, the bond shorts are going to get their balls squeezed off. Simple as that. It's already happening. Obviously, you know, there's been a lot of pain in the last week or two. Shorting the two year was a surefire thing, and everybody and his brother were, were doing it, and it's blowing up in their face. So it has a, the unwind of that has a long ways to run. It has to do with a reversal of Fed policy because the Fed is wrong on the economy. They're always wrong at major inflection points, and the economy's weakening. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not a bubble person. You know, I mean, this is bearish ultimately for the stock market, but not yet. So get, getting back to what the model does, it gives member direction, position. That's number two. So position, for me, in, in the Belkin report, I've been long FANG stocks and tech only, solely for months. That's been the only long. Things like Tesla are, you know, to down, not those aren't the top picks, but basically large cap fan stocks. And I'm not Jim Cramer. I'm not a bubble person, right? Like these were my favorite shorts. These were the model shorts last year. So now the model changes. It's not a broken clock. But where are we? Remember position, seventh inning. Okay. We're getting late. The game, you know, so it's still there. And it could continue for a little while. Um, by the way, I do not like the market short term here at all. I think it's um, I think this is way overdone. The Wall Street Journal reported yesterday put volume at the highest level on record last Friday. So I think we're seeing a squeeze of, of puts. Basically, it's delta hedging going into expiration. There's some kind of weird thing going on. So I don't think the market likes. I'm not I, I'm not saying we go up like a rocket. It's it's this is a difficult positioning environment. Make no mistake about it. But let me just, so what has the model been short? It's been saying to buy FANG stocks and tech only, right, for months. And what has it been saying to sell? Energy, financials recently, that's a recent ad, and defensive groups, defensive sectors. Now, let me just explain what's happened this week. As of, I just I just put this out, I just um, calculated this a minute ago. So this week, the NASDAQ's up 5%. New York FANG index is up 9%. 
the XLF financial sector index is down 4%, and the XLE energy sector ETF is down 7%. So you've got FANG up 9%, energy down 7% in a week, four days, right? So what's that? That's, that's like up 15, 16% by long FANG, short energy. And I can't, you know, sentiment is a really important thing to me. I'm always looking at contrary sentiment. By the way, uh, the CNN Fear and Greed Index is right now is an extreme fear. I just got there and it can stay there for a little while, but it's just a good indication that, you know, people are, along with all that put buying last Friday. So I don't like the market short term, but I think how somehow we kind of wiggle our way higher for another month or two. Fang exclusively, not financials, not energy, not defensive, not healthcare, not, you know, consumer staples, things like that. The, you know, the Dow and the S&P are, are acting very tired. It's just purely NASDAQ. So again, I'm not a bubble person, but I just think that's the squeeze. What is the market doing? It's squeezing people out of bond shorts. It's squeezing them into something and the stock market's going up. So what are they going to buy? They can't buy banks, right? You get, you know, the bank, you know, financials down. Uh, 4% this week. Some of these banks down 20, 30%. Uh, by the way, I run a, I, they don't mind if I share this. I run an alpha capture fund portfolio for a hedge fund, major hedge fund. And they have 179 contributors. Alpha capture means they take your, they implement your long and short ideas. They, you can put on 50 long and shorts, whatever it is. Right now I'm ranked number one for the first quarter with them up about 30%. That's ahead of all kinds, you know, the sell side guys, buy side guys, independent guys. So it's not, I'm not always at the top of this, but th- it's been working what I've been saying. So I was long a lot of these fangs kind of stocks. Right now I'm short, I've been short financials for a week in there. So anyways, the sector rotation, there's just been this momentous, this is a huge opportunity, right? And I mean, you don't want to be bought, selling them at the bottom and buying them at the top. And right now I would say the net, even though I'm bullish on the NASDAQ, this is this, to me, it's short term, very toppy in the short term work. Yeah, and, mm-hmm. and I will say it's, it's interesting right? because I mean, part of that tech fuel is the momentary death of the value style. I mean, if you talk about value versus growth, which everyone always tries to contextualize things like that, what's value? Financial ener- energy. <laughs> what's growth? Tech. You basically killed the entire value thesis in a matter of a week. Yeah, absolutely. That's financials, high yielding, low beta, defensive stocks. That's the IWD. ETF, Russell 1000 value, that's the biggest weight in there. And of course, tech and FANG are the biggest weights in, X, uh, I mean, IWF, which is the growth. And you're right, that I, I have that as, I've had that trade on for months, basically. I'm saying buy growth, short value, which is not intuitive. Okay, the model is not, it tells you what the market is likely to do, not what necessarily might make sense intuitively. So you have, you know, Anyways, I think that has a way to run. But remember, seventh inning, this isn't going to last forever. And I'm not a bubble, I'm not a perma ball, not a bubble person. I'm not Jim Cramer. But so um, I, I would say, you know, the opportunities are you, you don't buy them at the top. So right now, whatever's happening in the Nasdaq is like gone. It's gone. It's over the top for me. Like short term, you have these big, you know, three. 5% moves up and down. I think the short term is topping. Maybe it rallies into a little bit tomorrow. But I do not like the short term. I'm just talking days or a week or so. It's acting very overbought, you know, overdone. I don't think we're, we're breaking out to the upside here. I, mean, I think it's like completely overdone. However, the banks, now the banks are very interesting. They don't bounce back very much. And um, so let's just think about what this, what this bailout program has done. It's it's assured the banks that the Fed will buy their assets, which are trading at 20 to 30% below what they paid for them, at par. Okay, and the, that's QE. The Fed gives them new money, and the Fed takes their stuff onto its balance sheet. That's straight ahead QE. There's no other way to define it. But that doesn't help the bank stocks. Okay, so what I had this great um, professor at UC Berkeley Business School, David Pyle. He's a really wonderful banking expert. and Back, at, back then, it was di- he called it disintermediation. So what was happening is the savings and loans were going bust. This was back in the 80s when I was in business school. And the people were taking their money out of the savings and loans and putting them into safer banks and money market funds, things like that. So now what's happening is, clearly, people are taking their money out of these regional banks, you know, the first republics of the world. I mean, there's a whole 
pile of them um, that I'm short. And it's not going to end, right? And people, they're not, they're not going to take the Fed guarantee at face value. They're just going to get me out now. So the, the banks are going to have disintermediation. They're going to lose deposits. And it may, they may not go bust because the Fed will save them by, they can sell these securities, which would, they would wipe out their uh, capital if they sold them at the true market value. So the Fed's giving them a free ride, right? But it's not going to help the bank stocks. So I think you short bank stocks on any bounce. And we had, so we had a huge collapse last Friday. We bounced on you know, Monday, Tuesday. Banks to me are short. Anytime they go up, you know, a little bit, not all banks. Okay. Not completely, but particularly you have to subscribe to the report to get the names that, that we're recommending. But um, anyways, they're more like the, there's a certain threshold of banks that have, they have a high amount of, underwater securities that they're going to have to get rid of to the Fed, and then they're, they're going to have deposit outflows. So anyways, enough said on that. The banking crisis, banks are short. I think that's going to continue. You, you Whenever, you, and of course, not in a straight line. It's like a lightning bolt. You can zigzag down two steps, up one step, you know, up two steps, down three steps kind of thing. So if you get two or three up steps in the banks, you short them. Not all of them, again, but like XLF, I think, is safe, or KBE. Those are two things, ETFs, you can short. And also energy. Now, energy, you know, I have clients that want to know about contrary, what people are saying about contrary sentiment, because they want to take the opposite position when, when sentiment gets really extreme. And I'm a big fan of that. When sentiment gets too far one way or the other, you want to take the opposite position. But you never know exactly when. That's when the model comes in. But even those same clients that want to know about contrary sentiment, They've been arguing with me for weeks and months about energy stocks. I've been saying sell energy. The model says it's all over. Energy peaked, energy price is going down. And they say, no, 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 they're so cheap. So the value guys, like they're looking at, oh, these stocks that have good cash flow, get high dividends, Warren Buffett is buying Occidental, blah, 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 blah. But it, again, so the XLE is down 7% this week. So that trade is over. And so again, not, nothing goes in a straight line. I would wait for a bounce, but I like shorting energy stocks. That's a really non-consensus trade right there, okay? I've been saying it for months. It's working, and it's it worked in spades this week. Probably bounce back some. But so I'm giving you short ideas. So KBE banks, XLF banks, XLE for energy. That's really broad. Um, if you, I have a bunch of of names, I'm not going to give them here. You know, think, you know, that's from the report. And also OIH, oil service. So that's another ETF. So there's a short ideas, long ideas. It's just strictly things like Apple. You know, I hate to sound like Jim Cramer, but <laughs> sometimes things just set up like this. You know, and not now. Again, I say short term. This market is very, very toppy and overdone. Could pull back by two to five percent really easily over a few days or into next week. But next, again, we're seventh inning, so we got a couple more innings to go. But what else in the world is there going up anymore? I, I mean, I covered all my longs. So emerging markets over, Europe over, you know, it's bounced back big today, up 2%. But, you know, your stock was up 2%, DAX was up 2%. Things like that, not Europe is over for me. You know, I don't, um, I think you want to be shorting Europe on a bounce, not yet, it bounce a little bit more. But that's kind of the overall view. Also, one interesting thing, I had been short the dollar for about three or four months. It was worked, worked some, you know, DXY went down three, four, five percent, something like that. I covered that a few reports ago. Um, I've been long for a bounce. That is out. So the, to me, the long-term forecast remains down for the dollar, DXY against everything. Now, the Fed change in policy, which is looming, right? So maybe they raise rates by another 25 basis points or something, and then they get, you know, the, the Fed's worst nightmare is causing the Great Depression, right? Being tight for too long. That was Bernanke, right? The Fed was too tight in 1929. It caused the stock market crash, blah, 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 blah. So they know that. I mean, these guys... Pal, that's their worst nightmare. Which, which, by, which, by the way, which, by the way, is real quick. I mean, so this is why a lot of the, a lot of people the last week and a half or so have been saying this is the credit event, and I, I keep going back to first of all, uh, the credit spreads are not really blowing out in a way you would expect in a credit event, but you're exactly hitting on it, the, the key point. They know that it could be a severe credit event, so what do they do? They get ahead of it. I mean, th this this is one of the fastest crises you can argue after COVID. 
that we've seen. Yeah, absolutely. So they all of a sudden they're back to QE. They're not calling it QE, but it's QE for sure. You take something at 70 cents on the dollar and give them 100 cents on the dollar and give them free money. That you know, I learned that I worked for a government securities dealer. You know, I watched the I watched Treasury auctions when the Fed, so Solomon would bid on $2 billion of the two-year note, and we'd get to take that onto our balance sheet. And then, you know, a day later, the Fed would call us up and say, well, we'll buy that off you. You know, we'll buy a, a billion of that off you. And so when the Fed buys a billion dollars off a government securities dealer of Treasuries from the Treasury auction, that's new money. It's counterfeit, you know, <laughs> except it's legal. <laughs> so that's how they create money. Everybody knows that now, but I mean, I, that was back in the late 80s. Nobody was really attuned to that. So they're doing that in another roundabout fashion now. So it's back to QE and back to the point, bearish for the dollar. Okay. Now, if, what are you going to do? I mean, you're going to buy the euro. There's, there's a lot, you know, and there's emerging market currencies are not going to go zeroing off anytime soon. But it's undermined the case for being long the dollar. So people are buying the dollar because the Fed's going to raise interest rate, blah, blah, blah. And inflation is so bad. We got to So you know, that's why they're buying, that's why they bought the dollar for previously and then. For this balance, I think that's over. So it's undermining the dollar, Fed policies, undermining the dollar, good for bonds, treasuries, bad for credit spreads. So treasuries rally, junk bonds I do not include in that scenario. Junk bonds down. So I have credit spreads widen. I closed all those positions out recently. I had uh, long junk bonds and for OAS credit spreads going down, that's over. So we're into this treacherous environment that probably continues with a stock market squeeze for another month, you know, I don't know, seven, I, I, don't don't call me. I'm not exactly sure when I'm sitting on the edge of my chair watching it, but it's definitely the, the world is rolling over, right? So it's Europe's over, European stock index rally over. China, I'm not so sure about, you know, China's out, Asia's out, emerging market longs, they're all out. Uh, the only game left in town is FANG, and it's a squeeze, okay? Because if, so if you're a portfolio manager out there, you're getting killed on your energy stocks, getting killed on your financial stocks, your defensive stocks are not outperforming. They did this week, but they haven't been for a while. What are you going to do? You're going to buy FANG stocks. <laughs> Sadly, but... We're back, we're back to where we were before all this started. It's the same environment all over again. Because uh, I'm in agreement with you. It's like, you know, this whole uh, securing the depositors is another round of stimulus by any other name, right? So we're in a pre-election year. I myself keep referencing the point that I think it's going to be hard for the bears by year end, just given that cycle. And most pre-election years are strong because of stimulus, and it so happened that we're not getting a form of that now. But I want to go to the seventh inning point, because I'm going to assume that the ninth inning would be the credit event, would be the real blowout, the VIX spike. I myself am of the mindset that it probably happens later in the year. It's about the path more than the prediction. But if you were going to say to yourself, okay, here's where there's a higher risk of an accident, not what we've seen here, an accident meaning spreads really blowing out, VIX going solidly above 30 to the 40s. Is that a, a third quarter, fourth quarter type of time frame? Sooner, probably. You know, I mean, I'm not, I don't exactly know. I don't have a firm number on that, but it's getting very late in the game. And just to put things in perspective, let me tell you about some of my other shorts that will answer your question in a roundabout way. So what about securities brokers? Okay, so they they talk, with the financials, they got dragged down. There's a bunch of those. Those are great shorts to me right here, you know? So, you know, gold, not so necessarily Goldman, Morgan, yeah, but there's, you know, look at, you know, Schwab, Jefferies, things like that, RJF, SF, uh, those have rolled over. Here's another one for you. Asset managers, junk bond shops, okay? There's only a few of them. KKR, AP, APO, BX, CG. I think these guys depend, their oxygen tank depends on junk bond market operating. Okay. Like they're, they're, they're diversified. You know, they've got some other things, but um, they're already having problems with some of their real estate funds. But if you can't roll, if you can't pivot out of your, uh, of your LBOs because you can't float junk bonds anymore, game over. Okay, so I like the junk bond shops. I just mentioned them as shorts. Asset managers in general look terrible to me. Another one's, I, I'm getting a few names here from the report, but uh, I, I don't want to go down the whole list. Also, uh, some other things. What about, I have retailers. 
Okay, so this is again, this is kind of answering your question in a roundabout way. The economy, I see peaking. Retail sales were not, you know, let me, you know, the the government released these these numbers in January that were complete bullshit. Okay, like I keep, I save the series in a spreadsheet, and I get, I, they revised all the numbers back, and they revised CPI, retail sales, even the JOLTS report. And for like, just with the most, I, I just couldn't believe it. Like, wow, they added jobs. Okay. They added like something about 500,000 jobs per month. That's a huge number going back like 18 months, ever since the beginning of the Biden administration. Hello. Now, first of all, and then they said January was such a strong month, right? For jobs and for retail sales. That's total bullshit. If you know anything about the cycle, the, the economic cycle, things expand until December. Then there's a complete collapse in January because it's at it's the end of holiday sales and the company and retailers fire a bunch of people. So somehow they airbrushed that to show like a huge increase in jobs and retail sales. Total bullshit, right? I just don't believe it. Anyways, the model forecast, even with their bullshit numbers, um, points down. So I, I have all this stuff topping economically, retail sales, jobs, topping, unemployment rate bottoming, industrial production is declining, not just in rate of change, it's below the level from three or four months ago. Same thing with capacity utilization. So the important things in the economy are sales and production, right? You know, GDP, you'll find out much later. It'll be too late to have any investment implications. But the things to watch are, of course, PMIs, things like that, um, retail sales, industrial production, and jobs. Now, jobs are a lagging indicator, right? But um, and that's what the Fed is. Oh, employment so strong. We have so many more offers. Job offers. What a bunch of bullshit. I mean, they are they have been paying attention to the biggest lagging indicator, right? Well, everything else is already plummeting. Energy price, you know, that's more leading. Um, and then obviously there is still some some inflation in the services kind of stuff. Lagging indicator. It's all going to go down. So I guess to answer your question, I think we're in this transition period where the economic weakness has yet to make itself obvious to bubble people, okay, and to the Fed. And when the Fed gets religion and realizes, oh, shit, (laughs) we've been tightening into a weakening economy and this thing is going down the tubes, then we're going to have, just like we had with the COVID crisis hit and they panic, then they're going to be, you know, reverse course, and we're going to have cut rates, QE, and you know, blah 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 blah. So that's what's that lying ahead. Not, I, I like you're saying, third, fourth quarter. I think it happens before then. Let me get to some of the audience real quick. By the way, I, I did put out that tweet. It's like, you know, if this continues, the Fed's going to have to cut rates, and then we're all fucked <laughs> when everything. Because historically, when they cut rates, it's that pivot when you have the bulk of the drawdown, which would you know be interesting if that happens timing wise uh, sooner than later. Let's go to. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That that was what I was referring to in asset managers. And uh, another group that I have that's a little bit like that. That's a, uh, So I have a lot of these custom industry groups in the Belkin Report. One is auto finance. And um, so there's only some of these are mostly uh, they're kind of small, medium sized companies, tickers, NICK, CACC, CPSS, guys like that. They're in trouble. Alley, Alley, A-L-L-Y, Alley. I, it's another, you know, there's anybody in the financial space to me is suspect. And, you know, again, this is, we had the first break and it was pretty terrifying, right? You know, the first sell off of Friday into the first days of this week, last week into this week. I think you're safe shorting financials. And I, I agree credit, particularly in the, for like you're talking about low quality credit, probably a below investment grade credit. That is really in trouble for me, you know. So I see spreads widening. Anybody that's involved in that space is going to get the default rates are going to start going up. The economy is going to weaken. Cash flow is weaken, et cetera. Anybody that's doing that stuff is going to be in trouble. So that just gets me back to the, you know Apollo, you know KKR, Blackstone, uh, CG, Cargo, you know. So. That's that's about the best uh, insight I have into that subject. I, I'm curious, real quick, Mike, and we only got a few minutes here. Everybody, first of all, make sure you follow uh, Belkin Report on Twitter. Again, I'm streaming this via Zoom, given some technical difficulties. Uh, I will try to retweet for those that are interested how to get access to the Belkin Report uh, after this conversation. But how does the model 
so far look compared to maybe how the model looked in 2008? Because everyone always goes back to, here we go again with another GFC. Any any parallels there? Or is, is any of that valid, do you think? Starting to be a little bit like that. So, you know, 2008 was a very difficult trading market, right? So there was there were a lot, there were false odds where you could got squeezed back in into going long in the market and then the bottom fell out. So in terms of positioning, and then of course the financials pulled the bottom out of everything and by the end of the year, and the market bottomed in March of the next year, 2009. So I don't think it's exactly the same. And I, I, I've given up the practice of overlaying one chart with another year's chart because they always diff, diff, they always go bad. You know, they work for they get while. some great engagement on Twitter, though. They get some great engagement on Twitter. All those parallel charts, the overlays, the people love to see them. Yeah, but things, they're similar. They're like, you know, there's, there's similarities, you know, they're cousins maybe. But maybe we now that the financial... Now that we've got a credit event, the thing is, the big banks, so Lehman was pretty big, right? You know, maybe not, not the biggest, but I don't see, well, well, how, hang on a second here. We got credit squeeze, okay? So credit squeeze, you know, they got $50 billion today from the Swiss National Bank. And we'll keep them afloat for, I don't know, if they're getting redemptions, which they probably are, and keep them afloat for I don't know how long. But um, so credit squeeze is the only thing I can think of that I can point to. It's a short and it, it's a potential because of the derivative market exposure, it could have effect on other places, you know, and everybody that has exposure to them. So they're pretty big in the derivatives market. I'm not a big expert on this. But other than that, like if you're taking your money out of First Republic or one of these banks, you know, Zion or WAL, all these, you know, all these Bank of Hawaii, where are you going to put it? You know, you're going to put it in a money market fund or you're going to put it in J.P. Morgan Chase, OK, or Bank of America. So these guys are getting big deposit inflows. So right now it's disintermediation. It's out of like crappy smaller banks into large safe banks. So I, I don't see them in trouble. You know, I see them be, be actually benefiting from this, not necessarily the stock prices. Now, don't get me wrong there. I'm not saying buy J.P. Morgan or Bank of America, but I mean, they're, they're benefiting from this. It's more. So it's more kind of like a medium, small level at the moment. The only one, though, you know, Credit Suisse, that's really one. I don't, you don't need me to tell you more about that. That's in the headlines, you know, left, right, and center today. But that that one could have implications. Oh, by the way, the European banks probably have a lot of exposure to Credit Suisse, like maybe more than U.S. banks. And I, I had them, I had them as shorts this week. That's working. I had them as long as I switched around. But boy, they're really... But the European banks were outperforming like crazy until, you know, like six or seven days ago, and then all of a sudden, boom. So this has really been turning uh, turning on a dime in the financial sector. And will it feed on itself? Yeah, but I, you know, do I think it's like it's something as big as Lehman in the U.S.? No, not yet. I don't see it. I could be wrong, but um, the only one out there that that seems like you know. If, if it goes from Credit Suisse into somebody else over there, then it could potentially be a European thing, right? And so they, they just raised the interest rates, right? The European Central Bank raised interest rates by 50 basis points today. Again, whoa, hello. <laughs> nice timing. <laughs> We've got a bank almost, you know, a, bank, a, a major, major uh, systematic a bank uh, that's, you know, crit critical to the system. And they raised rates by 50 basis points. It just shows you how out of touch central bankers are. They, you know, they got behind the curve. And I'm just, just one thing I have to say about that. So how do we get in this mess in the first place? COVID. COVID hit. Everybody panicked. All these mask mandates and expanding the Fed's balance sheet and shutting everything down. It was complete overreaction. It was like worse than Y2K, right? Were there bodies lying in the street? Like, yes, people died. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, if you got sick from this or something, you know, I'm, I'm, please, please forgive me. I'm not criticizing that. It was not something that was going to kill 99% of the people, right? The survival rate is 99.9 something percent. And the people who were getting hurt by it were mostly elderly. Same, same thing as the flu. Okay, so what did they do? They freaked out. The Fed expanded its balance sheet completely recklessly. Told, it took interest rates to zero. So it was never going to raise them again. It ignited this bubble, which I was long at the time. But that was a complete overreaction. They waited way too long to begin tightening. So now it's the opposite, right? So they, they, they keep, now they're, just like they said, they were never going to raise rates again. You know, we're not even thinking about thinking about raising interest rates. 
now they've been saying this BS about, oh, we're going to keep raising every other day, these guys, until the let, notice the last few weeks, you don't see them out there anymore. <laughs> you don't see Fed officials talking about how bad inflation is because they're blowing up the banks. <laughs> I yeah. even laugh. But I mean, the, the sheer incompetence. I mean, these guys employ 300 something PhDs, right? I, I was looking at getting on this track when I was, I was, I went to the economics department where Janet Yellen was at the time when I was at UC Berkeley. And I looked at this and I said, no way. I'm, I, I want to, I'm not going to have a PhD career in this science, in, in this pseudoscience. There's got to be a better, but so I just didn't like the forecasting stuff I learned in macroeconomics and e econometrics. And so I, I, that my whole thing is about developing a better way of forecasting, you know, and it's not perfect, you know, it's certainly not 100%. But it, it manages to catch some of these twists and turns and turning points. Um, so that's yeah. about it. That's how we got in this mess, and that's where we are now. I think that's a uh, that's a good place to wrap this Twitter space up. Everybody, please make sure you follow Michael Belkin. Again, apologies for the uh, late start on this, but I'm glad we got it working. And Michael, hopefully we'll have you back uh, in a few months here.